CERN is really dedicated to creating just and sustainable communities through three interrelated programs, sustainable environments, strong local economies, and thriving cultures. And we also aim to tap into the promise of philanthropy by seeking and making bets on those social change passing years. And a lot of that we heard this morning. We heard this thread of great emerging urban patterns. And it was punctuated by this notion of infrastructure accelerators, which is sort of music to my ears because my portfolio at CERNA is uh, framed around next generation infrastructure. Um, we heard about sustainable design opportunities. We drilled down into innovative transportation solutions and built environment frontiers. And now we're going to pivot to the challenges of adaptation and renewal. And we know cities have been adapting to changes, social, economic, environmental, over many, many years. Um, but where are we now? Right? We've got soaring energy consumption storm surges and extreme weather events across the globe. We've got, we're, we're sort of in uncertain political and global, complex global economic times. And so how are cities relating their past and current place in time to their futures? How are we adapting and really what is urban design? So we've got this amazing cast of characters to help us uh, go through this journey today. Uh, Valente Sousa is director of IQH, uh, basically a hydraulic intelligence. He's an architect and urban designer. He's got extensive experience in public policy in Mexico City and beyond, really specializing in land use and water issues. And just in talking with him as we were preparing for this panel, I think he combines this layer of, well, multiple layers of public policy innovative design, and community engagement. I think you said to me, the, the landscape talks to you, uh, and that the new variable in urban design is the environment. And his work is really proof that you can achieve sustainable design in public policy at a grand scale. And we've got Alex Washburn, who is the chief urban designer for New York City and the planning department. He's worked in the public and private sector. He served as a public works advisor to Senator Monaghan, so he's earned his political stripes. Uh, and he brings this notion of innovative landscape architecture to New York. And it connects very powerfully with Plan NYC, which is really a set of programs and actions to help the city adapt to climate change. Uh, and I think I've read in interviews where you put a premium on techniques of landscape and an understanding of nature informing 21st century cities. So we look forward to hearing from you. And then Seng Kwan is an assistant professor of architecture at Washington University, and he teaches courses in architectural history and urban design. He's got enticing book titles and exhibit titles like Architectural Encounters with Essence and Form in Modern China. And I think my favorite is Metabolism, the City of the Future. And the one in the works is uh, On the Thresholds of Space Making, uh, installation art by young Japanese architects. So in, in talking with Seng, I really feel his connection between the edges of modern design and culture. So I think Valente said as this panel started uh, coming together that they have lots in common, even though they haven't met. So now they've met. Um, and so let's listen this afternoon to what they hold in common uh, to this sort of opening question to kick it off. And, and that's to have each of you describe the, a plan or project in Mexico City, New York, and Shanghai, respectively, that connects the goals of sustainable city and uh, metropolitan economy. Valente, do you want to get us started? Thank you. First, uh, the Brookings and the Washington University has done a tremendous job of putting together this, this panel, where the huge discussions of this century are, are ma mainly the, the, the topic. Um, all cities have geographical contexts, and, uh, and that's where where I started to figure this out many years ago, about 30 years ago, 
the uh, most of master planning <coughs> it's based on on a ratio of population growth to services and utilities and uh, when I realized that that was the equation I said well this is like playing monopoly it doesn't make much sense if you don't put the occupation of land related to the landscape where this occupation takes place that it has a geology it has mountains it has forests it has aquifers it has a number of issues which uh, originally made the settlement of a central of a, of a of an urban sprawl take place in the first place and then we forgot about it because we became imbued in our cars in our televisions in our work in taking the children to school so we forgot the memory of space and uh, in, in, in a sense this is a very uh, uh, compelling image that has allowed me to convince uh, public officials that they have to redraw it's like the the drawing of where we live has been faded out and I tried to fade it in in a cinematic fashion so you start to understand that in the case of a very clear landscape like Mexico City Valley it's it's in a high plateau valley 6,000 feet above sea level surrounded by volcanoes that were uh, uh, being born a million years ago and that spewed ashes and alluvion over this great basin and that's what created Mexico City with its theoretical lakes they were not lakes they were marshes what happens is that as it was a closed space it didn't have any source of water except for rainfall it doesn't drain to the sea it just stays there it's a huge cup of water so if you forget that you start to live the city as a hell because it gets flooded all the time because there's no way out so the major infrastructure the most expensive infrastructure that Mexico City has it's three pipe systems which are uh, 30 feet in diameter to drain rainfall out of the city so why we started to do this because we started to think of the city as a flooded area instead of saying let's use the rain percolate it and then use that water uh, for the livelihood of the city so that's what we started to do uh, six years ago thanks to basically political leadership by the former mayor of Mexico City uh, 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 Mr. Ebrard and Marta Delgado the Minister of the Environment they had the vision and the commitment to say we have to understand where we want to have the city within 40 years and the first thing we have to start with is by recreating the landscape where we live we cannot look against the landscape we have to work with the landscape so what Mexico City did, I don't know if I'm fine in time, you'll tell me. What, what, yeah, why don't you, like... Uh, what Mexico City did was basically to <coughs> protect the lands where we can have infiltration into the aquifer, which incre it would create new forest lands that were being eroded and taken over by landscape uh, development, by, I'm sorry, for, by by real estate development so we sequestered 4,000 hectares which is about 7,000 acres of land away from urban development not like a ring road around London but as, a, as a polygons because of the geography that are taken out like mini forests within the city and uh, the percolation index of those areas is 1,000 times what it rains so anything that would rain there would percolate and that will give us autonomy of water uh, forever because it rains forever it rains all the time in the in this in the western side of Mexico City it rains four times more than in the northern part of the valley so it's just basic logic that you increase the forest areas there and then you have a reasonable city that has a microclimate that has a response to the landscape and you have new parks and new areas where the city can start to live and start to understand their city where the way we did this was to talk with the the people living next to these ravines and they participated in the master plans that protected these areas we'll Let's talk about it back further. to that yeah i think exactly. we'll come back to that but that's mm -hmm. a great illustration of how you how the public mindset was getting more connected to the physical geography and 
some that, of the That was a turning point. That's that a great, was a turning point. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's an important piece. Alex, what do you say about New York City? Uh, well, I, I, I guess first I'd like to say something globally. And um, it's, it's great to be in a setting like this that, that Brookings can bring together, that the Sam Fox School can bring together, where a lot of really intelligent people think about a lot of really large-scale problems. But that's in a context of the clock ticking. And Ricky said it this morning, there are certain cities in this world that are growing very, very fast. As an average overall in the world, you know, we're getting four million people every two weeks. It's a city the size of Paris every two weeks. But of course, it isn't Paris every two weeks. It's people coming to the edges of already established cities, cities that are underprepared with their infrastructure, underprepared with their understanding of how to manage their landscapes, underprepared for how to accommodate this surge in population. And then urban design is the tool that can change those cities. And so I want to talk for a moment about what urban design is, because really, it's one of the most powerful technologies we have, whether it is to achieve sustainability or social justice or anything else that relates to the form and function of cities. First thing to understand is that urban design does not design cities. Urban design designs the tools that build cities. So we have certain discrete, actionable products that we have to focus all our efforts on every day. These are rules, plans, or pilot projects. And they're used in a much larger context to affect change. An urban designer works at the, inf at the confluence of politics, finance, and design. You can be the best designer in the world, but if you can't do it under the pressure of politics, mm -hmm. under the economic demands, the quarterly demands of finance, you can't do urban design. So who is an urban designer? Well, I'm an urban designer. I'm an architect. Um, I draw very well. I wear black. Uh, <laughs> but my role models are not architects. In New York City, where, where I'm the chief urban designer, my role models are actually three people. The first one is Frederick Law Olmsted. Mm -hmm. okay? Olmsted was a landscape architect, and he could draw. But his life's work, which fostered a change in American cities across the country, was to provide New York City with an oasis, Central Park. And it's a fascinating history. But you know, when the commissioners in 1811 made a plan for New York, the great grid going up Manhattan, they didn't have Central Park. Their idea was if you wanted open space, you would go to the shores, the shores of these great rivers that we had, the East River, the Hudson, and there you could recreate. Well, the invention of the steam engine rendered that moot because now boats could tie up all along the shores of Manhattan. So by the 1850s, there was nowhere to go for peace and quiet and to enjoy nature except maybe a cemetery. Olmsted changed all that, and he changed it with nature. He inserted nature into the heart of a metropolis and changed everything. My second hero from New York is Robert Moses. Moses started as a parks commissioner. And many of his early works you know, we look on as, as just models of good government and making playgrounds for children, uncrowding neighborhoods of New York. Well, of course, through his very, very long career, where he very politically astutely agglomerated titles to himself. He never resigned from everything. <laughs> Start out as park commissioner, ah, throw in the head of tunnels and bridges, throw in this. By the end of his career, uh, I used to work for Senator Moynihan, which you mentioned. Senator Moynihan used to work for Governor Harriman. He was his briefcase carrier. And Moses worked with Harriman, I won't say worked for. And uh, Senator Moynihan used to tell me of these meetings where they would go into a room, Moses would be there, and he would simply hand the governor a manila envelope with a list of projects written in pencil as to what he wanted funding for. The governor took it, and that was that. That was the extent of planning at the <laughs> apogee of Moses' career. Well, my third and final hero 
is the woman who took down Moses, Jane Jacobs. And it was after the threat of Moses building a highway through her neighborhood of Greenwich Village that she organized, confronted, and met him. And she was an advocate for the quality of public life in public space, for the fine grain of a neighborhood where she lived, her friends lived, her children grew up. And she was able to stop Moses. She didn't defeat him. I think that's important to understand. But she stopped him. And she set off a chain reaction that we operate under to this day, where there is a balance of top-down planning in New York and bottom-up planning. And you can see this echoed in our legal framework called the Uniform Land Use Review Process. It is a clock. When a project starts, it goes through with a sort of a conga line because it, it meanders through this seven-month period where community groups can have their say, borough presidents can have their say. And ultimately, nothing that comes into the process leaves just as it started. But it is kind of a living legacy of that Moses-Jacobs interaction. So I know we're limited for time here, too. But every major project that happens in New York has to satisfy those three. My favorite recent project is the High Line, which have you all been to the High Line? Yeah. Have you all seen the neighborhood around it, how it's grown? The High Line was $100 million of public funds. It's resulted in $2 billion of private investment. Moses would have been amazed that it was started by two local community guys. Josh and Rob, forming the Friends of the High Line. Jacobs would be amazed that government could have gotten it right, that we could have done a planning framework that would very carefully harness that economic development that occurred as a result of the public investment in the park and shape it into certain envelopes of buildings that would preserve the light and the air to the park and keep it a place of beauty throughout its time. And then finally, I think, Olmsted would be very pleased with a walk down the High Line. It's like, like a ramble through Central Park, except it's 20 feet in the air. So I just want to use that as a paradigm for what I think successful urban design has to be in the 21st century. You've got to have the quantity of Moses, the quality of Jacobs, and you have to do it with the technique of nature that Olmsted understood better than anyone. Is that I love that, Alex, and uh, I love that you took us through the history of New York in terms of the, the scaffolding of urban design tools, and because we're about to turn to, to Sung, who's actually an architectural historian, so uh, that sounds like a good passing of the baton. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as an architectural historian, it would only be true to my metier for me to try to contextualize some of the things that's been happening to Shanghai's um, mobility, sustainability, and urban growth um, in these historical terms. As some of the speakers this morning have mentioned in terms of this DNA of the city or the culture of the city, generally sort of the sense of the long durée. So the one image I'm allowed to show, um, I'm sorry it's not bigger <laughs> than it is, um, is a display um, of uh, layers two uh, of the underlying structures of the city. One layer um, outlines the basic uh, network of Shanghai's metro system, and the other layer, a series of colored dots, are the major urban nodes that have been actually instituted um, by the government of Shanghai as the sort of um, overarching um, strategy in terms of urban growth and expansion. So the urban structures suggested, represented by the color dots, actually um, we see on the screen, is supposed to, supposed to suggest, you should take my word for it, a clear hierarchy. The 2001 master plan for the city of Shanghai um, calls for the so-called 1966 uh, framework regime, which, um, uh, which stands for one center, nine new cities, 60 new towns and 600 new villages. This hierarchical sy system has its origins in the pre-war plan for Shanghai, actually drawn just months after the end of World War II. 
by an international team of planners, engineers, and architects, many of whom were, in, uh, were educated in Germany and the UK. And we obviously see this hierarchical, uh, the, the hierarchical structure uh, reflecting some of the recent ideas coming in from Germany and the UK. Uh, for instance, the work of Walter Christaller, the urban geographer, and um, the um, British planner, Sir pa Patrick Abercrombie, who was, of course, the father of the Green Belt and also the New Town Movement. Um, it was actually this model first promulgated more than 60 years ago that the government of Shanghai's successive regimes, um, despite change of governments, that it has continued to update and to promote as the main strategy to remedy the issues of congestion and density in, in what is obviously China's largest metropolitan area. The second historical artifact is the me metro uh, the, is the metro system itself. I'm calling it as a, as a historical artifact even um, though it is not very old at all. Uh, the first line in Shanghai's vast network of subways opened not even 20 years ago. It opened in 1995. And in the next 13, 15 years, it has grown into a vast network of 13 lines, more than 300 stations, 510 kilometers of railway track, 8 million users use it on a daily basis, accounting for 43%, so almost half of the total movement in the city on a daily basis. And because of the financial crisis of 2008, an additional 30 billion US has been put into further expansion of Shanghai's metro system, which will yield a virtual doubling of the network from here uh, to almost 1,000 kilometer, uh, kilometer railway track by 2020. So far, so good. But so when we look at the two artifacts together, layered one on top of other, a very different picture emerges. The metro network does obviously a very good job of connecting these various dots to one another. But you don't actually get the sense that there is a sort of correspondence to this sense of hierarchy, the, the 1966 uh, framework. Shanghai's metro system is, in flat, uh, in, in, uh, is actually flat. Each line is essentially a duplication of one another, bisecting the metropolitan area from one end to the other, and with stations evenly uh, 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 spaced at regular intervals. In other words, Shanghai's transportation system, however heroic and commendable it is, um, surprisingly has not been working in a more complementary way to, this, uh, to the city's vision of its urban structure. Not much attention is, has, has been given to the idea of for instance, mobility at the local level, the last mile, so to speak, bring, with, uh, connecting the train stations to the actual destinations themselves. I'm actually particularly um, drawn to the comment made by my colleague Oliver, Oliver Schulze earlier this morning, this idea of slow transport versus high tra uh, fast transports, uh, for instance, how to navigate the vast distances, uh, uh, again, the scale that we're talking about, the radius uh, from the center of uh, Shanghai to some of these outer outlying new towns is 30, 40 miles. So that even at the faster of the, uh, of the commuter rail, it takes almost upwards of 45 minutes uh, or an hour to get through the city. Um, the, the kind of uh, um, stratification of different modes of transportation, if it makes sense to have a clear correspondence, correspondence between these two visions of the city. Well, that's very interesting. It, also, it almost weaves together that notion of, it, was there a missing piece of the, the bottom up on that last connector mile piece versus the top down and uh, some <laughs> earlier comments. But I know, so, so let's go back to that notion of bottom up, top down. And Valente, you talked to me a little bit about the master planning process in, in Mexico City and how it really became to be something that was, here's a government vehicle, but it's really owned and driven by the people. Can you talk a little bit more about how that has come into being? Yes, th this has to be, has to do with um, how public policy is done in Mexico. You have um, laws <coughs> that were implemented in the early 90s. It's called the federal law, the national law of environmental impact. <coughs> and that law 
by, by, by its design has obviously um, federal budgets attributed to what the law calls for. But no one had done any projects that would sequester or request that money from the federal government. So what we thought was we have to do um, uh, workshops with the people that live in the surrounding areas of these ravines, which uh, represent about uh, 6,000 acres of, of, of land, in order for them to understand why we're doing the master plan and for them to in put input into the master plan itself. So we did these large maps in, uh, in, uh, uh, in relief. There are one to 3,000, and we projected the city on these ravines so people would know where they lived in that particular territory. And then we did a methodology of saying, we are going to evaluate, give a value of how you invest over the years in, 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 the, in the improvement of these ravines. No? So uh, uh, as it is an environmental value area, we had to give a, va give a value. And people would put pins on, their, on, this, on this territory saying, there, we have uh, waste uh, treatment, wa waste uh, disposal on this point. We have an erosion of land in this area. We have the loss of forest in this one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that created a local database that is brought into a geographical information system. And we did from our end, as the, from from my 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 office, with hydrologists, geologists, botanists, ornithologists, a number of, of experts in uh, earth sciences. We did multi-tasking multi, uh, and, 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 and multidisciplinary workshops in order to bring in all the scientific data, put it together among the experts, and then crisscross it with the people that live in the territory, and that created basically the policies of the master plan. Once this master plan was finished, instead of giving it to the government, of course, it was given to the Ministry of the Environment, but politically speaking, we gave it to the people, to the, organiz to the, to the organizations. So when their boroughs presidents were elected, they would bring the master plans to the borough elected uh, officials and say, this is what you have to do for the next three years. And then the next one, and then the next one, because this is a 25-year plan. Once you have the master plan, Going back to the, to the, to the legal uh, guidelines of the LEGEPA, they can call in the, uh, the representative elected to the Senate and to the, and to the House of Commons, no, or the, 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 to, the, to the congressman, and say, we have this master plan. You can take out the monies that are already branded for, the, for, the, for, for these projects because we already have a project. No one had done that before. There was basically budgets that were never requested for and they would go back to the treasury year after year and now we have like 30 million dollars per year to invest on this and that will bring the cost of bringing water into Mexico City at 0 0.7 cents per cubic meter instead of three dollars per cubic meter which is the cost of pumping the water now so the 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 turning around of how you do public policy was thanks to the implementation of workshops with the people and understanding where the city is. We have a geology that allows that. If you live in, uh, in, a, in, a complete, in New York, which is basically granite, then you have a completely different system. You have the Croton system, which requires the forest around it to trickle down the water because there are no rivers there. It's basically been, been trochilated. How you say? It, it's been compressed by the retiring ice uh, 10,000 years ago, and that created the lakes of the Croton system. So you have a completely different policy to administer your water supply. But each geography has its own solutions. Um, and that's basically what you have to understand. And the people who live in a particular territory, they have to rediscover where they live. And that's why we did these large uh, scale maps in, in relief and then project them to understand where they lived in relation to the others. And I also love the element that you shared with me that there's a piece of that that's almost like a simulator. Like, so if you show an action to be taken uh, and the investment to be made, it sort of shows out over time the impact of that. So I thought that so, was correct great as that, well. And I'm just yeah, that's yeah. actually an interesting point because the the same environmental law that is mm -hmm. giving you funding in in mm -hmm. Mexico 
is inadvertently here in America keeping us from doing many projects. And again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't my area of expertise, but I see it in the timeline and in the tenuousness of major projects that I work on. <coughs> that because of the requirement to get a, f a finding of no significant impact from your projects, you open yourself up to a period of, of litigation which can often prove fatal to a project. I just want to bring this up, and, and here I have to state that this is, this is my view personally, and I'm not saying the, the view of uh, official policy of, this, of the city or any other branch of government that I've ever worked for, but um, we have to come from a, from a background where we think of the environment as something to be protected from us, instead get to an environment where we think of the environment as something to be managed by us. You know, it goes both ways. I live in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Hurricane Sandy flooded my house. I love nature. I <laughs> want to use it in any way I can. But I felt its effects. And I want to be able to undertake projects at the building scale, at the neighborhood scale, whose explicit purpose is to work with nature, countering certain of its forces that make my life more difficult but enabling other ecologies to also grow. Essentially, it's to open up an era of change. And I go back to urban design as a tool of change. But part of that underlying it is a, is a legal framework that has to adapt to the new needs of adaptation, right? We have to come into an era where we manage nature as much as we protect it. Also very interesting. Mm -hmm. I was actually just, mm -hmm. I was going to, ask you what your m most fresh memory of the impacts of Sandy were, and I think you already <laughs> answered that one, but <laughs> translate that into your role in the planning department, and, and where do you take that now in that sense of adapting tools and finance and law, and what's the one thing, what's the one next thing you think you can do? Okay, it, super complex problem. It really is this, this sort of adapting our cities um, to climate change that has already occurred. In fact, it's probably worth a, a quick definition here of sustainability. We use that term very, very loosely. But in sustainability on the ecological sense, there's mitigation, which is the efforts we do to reduce carbon outputs, which will hopefully help climate change in the future. But there's also adaptation, which are the measures we have to take today for changes that have already occurred. So making our buildings heat and cool more efficiently, that's mitigation. Mm -hmm. But doing something to protect my house from next year's storm, that's adaptation. So you can do that at three levels. You can do it at the building scale, where I could do something as simple as moving my electrical meters out of the basement and onto the first floor. As simple, have anyone of you tried to work with Con Edison? <laughs> 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 just to do that simple task is incredibly difficult. We, we recently, um, just a, a couple weeks ago, suspended certain, through executive orders, certain aspects of zoning to allow people to raise their houses if they were rebuilding with a new measuring point because we have limits on heights in different districts. Just to figure out and to, to imagine the implications that would have is a, is a huge process within a city. Now, that's just at the building scale. What about at the regional scale? Well, the streets, of course, is at a neighborhood scale. What can we do? Can we do anything with polders? Can we do anything with, uh, with marshes? Let's say, for instance, mm -hmm. Red Hook. Again, coastal city where we used to build ships in the 19th century. Wouldn't it be great if we could slow the lateral velocity of incoming waves by planting oyster beds and small reefs offshore? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the environmental impact statement for that looks like? <laughs> and then the, the big ticket items. What about floodgates? You know, the, the Thames has the Thames Barrage, which is in use constantly and saving London billions of, of pounds um, in, in protection that it gives. New York has a much more complex hydrology. Um, but there may be a role for these large scale, regional, almost national projects. They also have their own financing pathways, their own environmental impact statements, their own constituencies. If someone is protected from floods, does that mean someone else gets the water? 
How do you figure that out? So really, it's, it, it, it eventually comes down to a form of leadership, whether it can come from the community level, like the High Line did, or whether it has to come from President Obama. I don't know, but of the three four forces, politics, finance, and design, politics is the most powerful. That's a great point. I think I have learned when you ask a designer a question, you get layers of responses. I, I love that. It's rich. <laughs> it's, it's a rich fabric. But I, Valente, I think I was interrupting you at one point. You wanted to no, jump in. On was interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the, rather than, than um, managing nature, the, the approach, I think, even though it sounds poetic, we have to reestablish the conversation with nature. It's a, it's a, we have a monologue because nature is there. But conceptually, you, we have to reestablish that conversation. I was invited to a TED conference. And um, I, I mean, as it was a TED conference, I said, OK. And I talked about that we had to rethink our understanding of how we go about life with the ethics of water. If we think as of a water drop, then we start to understand in personalizing what the water does in the hydrological system, that the water has a right to fall on a forest, to trickle down into the mar marsh, to percolate into the rock, to run through a river without being uh, asphyxiated by pollutants, etc., etc. So if you put your mind into that conversation, you start to have a completely different approach to how you deal with nature. And nature, by definition, is the greatest teacher because it's a complex system. And you mentioned the concept of adaptation. Nature is basically the most complex engineering system in the world. And if you understand what it does, I mean, it makes me cry. <laughs> uh, you, a, a tree. Nature makes me cry sometimes. A, a, tree, a tree has has this this area of occupancy in in, in the landscape, but it has hectares of foliar area. So that's what engineering is. And it, besides that, it transforms solar energy into sugars and structures of 200 tons. So there's that's engineering. And if we start to see how we can build roads, systems, etc. We can take a lot of lessons from nature, in, in, in not in a, in, a, in a poetic sense. We can look a lot on how that conversation can reestablish. And so if we allow nature to be within our cities, we can be in living in a city that has right. densities, right. like high-rise buildings in Shanghai, yeah. Et cetera, et cetera, no, or New York City. Absolutely. And I want to take that one, one Quickly, further. Quickly, though, because I want to get some back Scale. Here. Scale. Nature is scalable. Exactly. And even poetically, in terms of beauty, mm -hmm. you know, the, the beauty of a forest isn't compromised by the multiplicity of leaves. It's, it's beautiful at all scales. But in a city, what we're finding now mm -hmm. is that we can gain almost the same advantage as a new large park by simply planting a million new street trees. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. Add up together all the net positive effects of the five foot by eight foot tree pits times a million, and you get the results you would have otherwise had to get by making a major, major um, land in investment. So That's a great point these about adaptation. And adaptation. Design. Nature is wonderfully scalable. Mm -hmm. It's two trees per car in, in, in carbon sequestration. It's nothing. Right. Two trees per car per day. That's an equation. That's a great point. So I love. <laughs> I love two <laughs> other things here. The, the notion of crying because we get connected to something that's, this is driven by passion, you can tell. Like how we live in our cities, how we want our cities to perform. It's, it is about connecting mind and heart in so many ways. And Sung, I know you deal on sort of in design and culture, um, but I also heard you say something uh, in our conversation that uh, there's an issue of governance that the management of cities need to be rethought. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on sort of that the management needs to be rethought and we have to relate design to cultural expression. Sure. Um, so obviously things work a little bit differently than they do in New York City. Public consultation to the extent that we're star starting to see them in places like Shanghai operate still unfortunately in a more perfunctory uh, manner. 
uh, perhaps it's closer to the Robert Moses way of doing things <laughs> 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 than what's been happening more recently. Um, in the case of Shanghai, this, um, uh, th this two-layer structure of, of the metro system versus the, um, the, the new town structure, um, one thing I, I just thought of is the first subway line in Shanghai opened in 1995. That was just about the same time when the housing sector in China, especially in Shanghai, became marketized. Uh, from dormitories for uh, workers and work units in, in, in the Chinese uh, planned economic system to, to the private, uh, to the private mar market. 15 years, while 15 years may not be, 18 years may not be a very long time in the construction of subway networks, uh, it is a fairly substantial period of time for the private housing market in Shanghai to emerge. Mm. And when, you, when we sort of contextualize this, um, in still the Chinese uh, land ownership system where the state still is the sole owner of land and the largest, let's say, operator of land um, it has serious ramifications uh, when we look at the distribution of the city where the housing stock is being constructed. And again, this issue of whether or not the new construction actually comports to the official vision of the city versus how they actually have evolved with the uh, uh, the construction of the, uh, of the railway system. So for better or for worse, you know, looking at empirical evidence, we see Shanghai still following more or less this conic model with the city center, the densest, where it taper, tapers off actually fairly dramatically toward the periphery, except for two or three isolated pockets where they had fairly long-standing um, centers of employment, for instance, university towns, steel, uh, mani uh, uh, st uh, steel plants, petrochemical plants. And these have been you know, around for, much, for, for quite some time. So. Right. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And so we've got a, maybe a little less than 15 minutes to go. And I do want to open it up to your questions for this panel. But I'm curious whether you have questions of each other, given the different perspectives that you've brought, even though you've got a lot in common. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. We have time. We'll talk more soon. But we should hear from you. Yeah. 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 Well, let's open it up for Q&A. <laughs> we got somebody way in the back. My question is, uh, in uh, planning in America, the existing land uh, subdivision pattern has a huge impact on subsequent design once the land's platted. In China, you've gone through your first cycle here, but with the, 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 if you have one property owner, conceivably those property lines are much, uh, much less tangible. They can be moved. And I'm wondering if that's going to open up greater opportunities for reuse and revisioning properties, unlike here where the, the existing property locks in very specific land uses. Well, yes, question about China. I know for well, New, I'll um, give you a New York answer, but <laughs> as far as I can tell, um, first of all, uh, private land ownership, pri private owned usership, I should say, really has been only around for not even a generation. Um, of it's certainly within a generation of the lifespan of uh, a building, a reinforced concrete building. Um, and as far as you can tell, zoning codes in China are, operate in a very, very, actually a different way than they do here in the U.S., where use and actually the, the building itself is prescribed to, adhere to, at least uh, on paper, in a more strict, uh, much more stricter way than, than they are in the U.S. So um, I think... In the, probably in the next five, ten years, we'll, we will begin to see how the secondary, uh, a secondary market might emerge in the renewal and adaptation of these buildings, but it's still something we're, we're um, not having a very clear picture of yet. Too early to tell. Right. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Please. Uh, the, the New York example I wanted to cite was the New York City block, 200 by 800. Okay. Um, that was laid out 18, 1811, 
was a decision. Uh, it's managed to have land uses and densities as diverse as within three blocks of each other, Empire State Building, and a beautiful set of Chelsea Row Houses. I think if there's any issue with the Chinese model, it's less perhaps the land platting than the road distancing and going to a kilometer grid with very wide roads. I think that's going to be the main hurdle to overcome. Um, because within any block, any city block, uh, we found that you can change the zoning lot configuration and the platting of individual lots as long as it's within a block. So the size and configuration of your block is probably the most important decision a new city can make. In, in terms of sustainability, which is the purpose of this conference, um, in the case of Mexico, you have the Ministry of Housing and land use and the Ministry of the Environment. One of the big <clears throat> hurdles that we have is to blend the master plans of environmental planning with the land use because land use is not urban planning. It's, it's basically retail and land selling and speculation. So we are doing that, that's the next phase, to blend <coughs> the, the kind of city we want within 20 years instead of being driven solely by land use. It's a huge discussion. I know we had a question waiting in the back. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Hines and I'm a geotechnical earthquake engineer. And geotechnical earthquake engineers always study Mexico City. <laughs> and we are taught that Mexico City is sort of a bowl full of jelly. Oh, which is the jelly is the clay that fills the, uh, the crater. Um, so I'm delighted to hear that there are porous materials through which you can percolate uh, water. Uh, I have two parts. One part is, did you have to sort of add to the porous materials so you had a place where you could percolate down to the aquifers and learning from what you've learned so far? Do you have any recommendations for the United States where we, have our, where we are facing an increasing challenge to deal with more frequent extreme storms that give us a lot of flood water and storm surge and increasing uh, periods of drought. So we do not have a national plan to manage our water so we can take that flood water and now put it where we have our drought uh, in an effective manner. So, so one, did you have to add to the percolation capability in Mexico City? And what recommendations do you have for the United States to manage its water? resources? Uh, a, a very kind and humbling question. <laughs> the, uh, in the case of, of the volcanic ring that surrounds Mexico City, by its geology, is basically a, por a very porous uh, rock. We, we did the, the testing of soil with, a, with our geologist, and we have, as I said before, 1,000 times the capacity to infiltrate of whatever rains there. So it's just a matter of slowing down and amortizing the, uh, the impact of the, of the raindrop when it falls. It has to come into a, a, a layer of under forest to have time for it to trickle down. That's all we need to do. Uh, initially, we're going to use geotextiles and a number of, of geomembranes to prevent the initial erosion, seeding it with, uh, with uh, local grasslands, which is uh, Mulelgervia which is a large grass that has uh, this form and it has deep roots and it will break the soil again for it to the first layer to become porous again and then just under 20, 30 centimeters, you have the, the percolation is, is there. So that's why forests are so important. And in the case of the, uh, trop the mid-tropical forest of Mexico, we have uh, 400 varieties of conifers and a number of oaks. It's a very uh, generous ecosystem. In the case of the, you cannot call it in the sense of the United States, but each region has its particular studies that have to be done, and its geology has its particular conditions of uh, if it's a, if it's non-permeable, non yes permeable, volcanic, glacial, uh, all sorts of conditions, you have to probably Re-establish the conversation with nature, as I said before, and understand that it is 
the landscape that will tell you the way is not that you have to go back to how it was and, uh, and become Yosemite Park all over the place, but you have to understand the borderlines between the urban sprawl and the beginning of, of, of the natural habitat. If you understand that frontier, then you'll do the master planning and regulations and planning in long term that will re-establish nature. Once you, you protect it, you can have the lions coming back again and the wild wildebeest coming back again. If you don't protect them and you're always regulating their extinction, they will uh, go extinct. You need to uh, give them breathing space, let's say, to, to those areas. What you were talking about, the oyster bays, to protect in sort of a, like a mangroves frontier in the coastline of, of eastern United States is the only way probably to start to create a frontier that eventually will tell you if it's going to work or not. You cannot do, do large infrastructures in New York because you have a river coming down from one end, which is a fjord all the way up to, uh, to uh, West Point, and you have the sea coming from the other end. The tidal waves, you can't control them. It's impossible. So you have to move population inland, probably. Yeah, the, yeah, the, like, yeah you will. Yeah. I mean, you will. You cannot put oh, them okay. in sticks. It's, it's, eventually, you'll do that. You'll start to become, make like a notorious right. city in the frontier that it starts to move backwards, backwards, backwards. And the new building of, of, of the coastline will have to be uh, five miles, 10 miles inland. The new building. And the, and the early building, it would, I mean, it will take you two, five years more to get another event like, like uh, Sandy, but you'll get it. We're, we're all going to get it. I mean, the trend is like that. Mexico City is going to have more rain every year for the next 20 years. And it is the same is going to happen with the northern Atlantic. It is a huge You'll have more challenge, moisture. Valente. I wanna, I, we've got <laughs> just a couple minutes, and I know we have a burning okay. question. Uh, Alex, um, a question about New York. I loved your redefinition of urban design as Beautiful. design of tools, not of bollards, which I think <laughs> is interesting. But and most people would disagree. Uh, but I think you're right. Thinking of um, the, the future of the city and its sustainability at all levels, what have you and Amanda Burden been able to do which has promoted jobs mm. as a designer, as a design chief? Because mm. often that's sort of divided up, right? Right. given that we're at Brookings. And Amy is going to ask this question anyway. I thought I'd get there first. <laughs> but what do you think you've done which has changed the profile of the city's job market and where it happens? Okay. Well, I have to, again, slightly layered answer. The first one, where it happens. Made a very conscious decision in the strategic plan for the city to create new business districts outside of Manhattan. Remember, uh, it's one of Mayor Bloomberg's biggest legacies is that he has brought economic development around to all the boroughs. So we have uh, now in various areas that we've rezoned to permit the sort of building that is needed for, for jobs. Um, in Queens, in downtown Brooklyn, uh, now we're even doing things like the um, uh, it's going to be rather large, the Cornell University um, and Technion University plan for the high-tech campus. Um, so they're, they're very explicit decisions to locate areas of growth for jobs, support that with transportation, uh, and with zoning, and with targeted public investments through the various agencies of the city. That's the technical approach. But there's also a qualitative approach. And that's one reason why urban design exists as a discipline within the Bloomberg administration. It's that Mayor Bloomberg believes cities compete on quality, uh, on quality of life. And it's a global competition. So Amanda, I think, has very successfully put forward this notion that to improve the quality of public life improve the quality of public space. And working with Jeanette and others, uh, transportation. Where do the jobs come in? Well, the jobs come in. We compete globally for many of those jobs. Many people come to New York because that's where they want to be. And being here, yes, they create jobs. They look for jobs. So the, the city, in other words, your city will have a hard time attracting jobs if it doesn't attract people. So its attractiveness to people absolutely. is absolutely important. And then there are other um, 
uh, Economic Development Corporation, others who work very specifically in, in a field that's not mine, but in working with business and the mechanics of understanding um, you know, the various requirements in, uh, through taxation, through um, uh, you know, uh, job sourcing, infrastructure for communications, et cetera. So the, the, the only point that I want to make is that it's a very conscious effort to attract and build on our jobs base but it also has this side of it, which is to make the city more attractive globally. So, you know, we're hoping that many people who might otherwise go to London might come to New York. Um, and similarly, Shanghai is in competition with New York for certain industries and certain people. Um, well, this has been a terrific panel, and I love that a conversation about adaptation and renewal was really grounded in history and these layers of, you know, not for, like having this memory of space and reconnection as we look forward uh, to renewal. So thank you all for that. And I just, we're gonna move into the last keynote of the afternoon about ecological urbanism. Uh, but before I bring up Bruce Lindsay, I just wanna thank this terrific panel. And we're going to get unmiked, uh, but Bruce is going to come up. And Bruce Lindsay is the E. Desmond Lee Professor for Community Collaboration and the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design at Washington University.